So hello everyone, my name is Anna Oshroff. I'm Assistant Director for User Services for Characterization at MIT Nano. Uh, and I'm organizing the Tool Talk series, series that is focused on introduction of new technologies or advancement in technologies to our users, prospective users and general audience. Um, today we're hosting Prime Nano. Prime Nano is a company focusing on electrical measurements on the nanoscale uh, via scanning micro microwave impedance microscopy. Um, and I will pass it to uh, Nicholas, who will introduce the speakers and we'll start the event. Hello, I'm Nicholas Antonio. I'm in charge of product management at Prime Nano. Uh, today, we'll, uh, I will be giving you a presentation on the company overview. And then I'll hand it over to my colleagues, Dr. Ravi Chintala and Dr. Yang Lian Yang, who will give you more information on the products we have at room temperature and low temperature. So Prime Nano is a young startup in Silicon Valley. Um, I'll give you a little bit of the, how we were formed and then a, an overview of our products and hand it over to Dr. Chintala, who will talk about the room temperature products, and then Yang Lian Yang, who will talk about the low temperature products. Prime Nano was founded by uh, two Stanford University professors, ZX Shen and Mike Kelly. Uh, we have multiple patents exclusively licensed to us from Stanford. We are the leader in microwave impedance microscopy with more than 95% market share. And we have grown uh, quite substantially uh, due to a major investment in our, in our hardware and the performance of the hardware is, uh, is uh, unparalleled. We will talk about that. And um, our product line is the ScanWave. Uh, it images electrical properties of materials at the nanoscale. And we recently released the ScanWave Pro with a 10x improvement in signal to noise so we can measure very, very low capacitance and uh, impedance. We are available on Bruker and Asylum AFM platforms. We make our own probes, um, the shielded probes. We'll talk about that as well. Our product line is uh, broken into two parts, the room temperature and the low temperature. On the uh, room temperature, we have the ScanWave Pro, which we will focus on today. We also have the 2.0, which is a lower performance product for cost sensitive applications. Again, they're available on Brucar Asylum and other industry standard AFM platforms. The low product, uh, the low temperature product line uh, has three products under it. Uh, two Kelvin low temperature, which is a uh, sub two Kelvin and up to 15 Teslas of magnetic field. Uh, an ultra high vacuum low temperature scan wave which can go below one and a half Kelvin and ultra high vacuum. It's in, in high magnetic fields. And this can be um, connected to a chamber for the position and transfer in vacuum. Um, and then we have the millikelvin product, which can go to below 100 millikelvin with high magnetic field and fast loading. The evolution of the room temperature scan wave uh, has been uh, to improve the performance by about 30% every few years. But then in the last uh, couple of years, we leapfrogged our own evolution and with a 10x improvement on the ScanWave Pro. It's a 10x improvement in signal to noise, sensitivity, and overall performance. So um, we offer today for room temperature, these two products, the 2.0 and the ScanWave Pro for ultra high performance. At this point, I'll hand it over to Dr. Ravi Chintala, who's going to talk about the room temperature products. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, I, as, as Nicholas mentioned, when we're talking to the, uh, about the room temperature scan wave systems, uh, beginning about the technology and give you a brief introduction of what uh, scanning microwave impedance microscopy does and what scan wave uh, measurements look like. Um, an idea about the hardware and uh, scan wave pro and then dealing with the the most important aspects, the materials and the applications uh, uh, from from a material science perspective. So 
Mm. Yeah, perfect. So to begin, to, where where uh, ScanWave stands, it's it's one of the electrical scanning micro uh, scanning probe microscopy technique. Uh, before we get into the uh, ScanWave systems. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, take a minute and talk about the uh, scanning probe microscopy systems or atomic force microscopy, wherein you have a sharp probe attached to a cantilever and you scan the surface and you look at the topography uh, by having a laser as a deflection feedback. Now, the traditional or the more popular other electrical um, AFM techniques are uh, uh, I have listed only a few here, scanning tunneling microscope, conductive AFM, Kelvin probe, and scanning capacitance. In all of these techniques, there is an electrical stimuli applied between the tip and the sample, and you look at various properties. In scanning tunneling microscope, you look at the tunneling uh, current. In conductive AFM, you look at the resistivity. Kelvin probe, you look at the contact potential difference. And the scanning capacitance, you look at the semiconducting materials by modulating the capacitance with the depletion width. Now, all of these techniques use an external AC uh, or external bias or a external voltage. Um, on the other side, let's say instead of the external uh, bias, we can also use electromagnetic waves. Uh, in this case, a, in near field regime, visible um, uh, light, so uh, such as NSOM or SNOM, the scattering optical microscopy in near field, when you look at the optical uh, response of the sample. In scan wave systems, it's a delay, I'm sorry. In scan wave systems, we use microwave frequencies through this um, uh, AFM probe, and we look at the reflections from the surface. And the reflections uh, uh, represent the impedance of the sample. Further, you can also apply in other electrical bias, like, like in uh, scanning capacitance microscope, you can apply an AC bias and you can also look at the um, uh, electrical depletion width or the, the modulation of the depletion width as you apply the voltage. So to come to the introduction of the scanning wave system, uh, in scanning microwave impedance microscopy, we use microwave frequencies to probe localized electrical properties. Essentially, we are looking at the impedance of the system and the impedance can be converted into permittivity and the conductivity at uh, microwave frequencies. Now, for a semiconducting material system, we can convert these uh, permittivity into carrier concentration and also the polarity of the carriers. For this, we have to use a specialized AFM probe, uh, which, which improves the uh, uh, surface uh, uh, sensitivity as well as the spatial resolution. SMIM is done in near field and hence we are only limited by the, the, res, the spatial resolution is only limited by the tip radius or the source of the micro radius of the source of the microwave. Um, and as it is done using microwaves, you can not only measure surface information, but also subsurface information. That is, you can look at buried interfaces as well. Now, as essentially we are looking at the permittivity of a material, this is widely compatible uh, with all mat mat many material uh, materials. You can look at dielectric, dielectrics or insulators, semiconducting materials, or or um, or the emerging material systems such as one D, two D, and the ferroelectric systems as well. So a simple uh, uh, operation is shown in this figure where we have the uh, where we have our ScanWave Pro electronics connected through an impedance matching circuit through the cantilever. A three gigahertz signal is passed through this, and you look at the reflected signal, and the reflected signal can be uh, decoupled into imaginary and the real part, the imaginary part will give, we call it a scan wave capacitance signal, and the real part would give the uh, resistance signal. Now further, if you have a, a sample which is uh, non-linear, uh, where the capacity or the resistance changes with respect to the applied voltage, you can apply an external bias and also 
obviously connected to your lock-in and you can look at the amplitude and the phase of variation of the DC dV or the variation of capacitance with respect to the applied voltage or the variation of resistance with respect to the applied voltage. For a semiconducting system, this uh, DC dV represents the magnitude of the carrier concentration and the phase represents the polarity, whether it's an n-type carrier or a p-type carrier. An example of the system uh, or when we attached it to Bruker AFM, this is a room temperature system that we are showing here. Uh, is shown in this figure, you have the ScanWave um, Pro Electronics box. Uh, the picture is shown on the top here, and this is connected to the um, probe interface module through a coaxial cable. The microwaves are transferred from the RF box to the, uh, to the probe interface module. And at the end of the probe interface module, we have the probes. These are very these are similar in form factor with respect to the other commercially available probes. But there is one uh, unique aspect to that that the cantilever is completely shielded. Uh, the microwaves are passed through the central metal line, and the all all the sides of the cantilever is um, uh, shielded with the metal, and the microwaves are only passing through this pyramid. And that makes the source of the microwave very tiny. That's the, with the tip apex about uh, uh, 10 to 15 nanometers in the radius, you get sub uh, five nanometers spatial resolution in the electrical uh, properties. So overall in one scan, apart from the topography, you can also get localized variation in the permittivity, localized variation in conductivity. And if you look at the DC dV signal, you can look at the relative variation in the um, uh, carrier concentration and the polarity. And the same is with the resistance variation. The, before we dwell into the applications, there are a few advantages in, uh, and the performance parameters that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the first is the capacitance sensitivity. This is the, uh, the contrast that, that, that the ScanWave Pro can see. This is less than 0 0.1 autofarad. That is, if there is a variation between two individual pixels, the variation of capacitance of less than 0 0.1 autofarad, uh, uh, scan wave can look at it. The dopant ra range for a semiconductor structures uh, is can be varied, can be uh, identified from about E12 to E21. So you have a wide range of coverage for the dopant variation. Uh, for the other electrical AFM techniques, usually the limit is or the variation is only between E15 to E20 or E21, depending on the, the techniques used. But the scan wave has its advantage of even looking at the lower doping levels. All of this with a spatial resolution less than 10 nanometers. Uh, again, this depends on the sample, uh, but we, we have reached sub two nanometers uh, spatial resolution as well. And we will talk about a, a couple of examples where we achieve that as well. As, as we are using microwaves, you're not only looking at the surface information or the surface response, but you can also look at the subsurface uh, uh, imaging as well. Uh, the unique advantage of microwave is that you do not need any electrical back contact to the sample. This actually minimizes the um, uh, sample preparation uh, in the sense that you can also look at uh, devices which are on insulating substrates or, or glass uh, quads or sapphire for general or silicon or insulator kind of devices can also be easily imaged. Um, we have we have made sure that these probes are very similar to the uh, commercial probes. It makes the uh, user experience much simpler and the learning curve much easier. The other USP of the microwaves and the scan wave systems is the response to variation in the permittivity. I'll talk about this in in detail in the next slide. Um, before that, before that, uh, the the other important factor is. Uh, the scan wave is compatible with most scanning methods in the sense that you can do it in 
contact mode uh, where the signal strength is much stronger because of the proximity to the sample. But you can also do it in tapping slash AC mode wherein you oscillate at its resonant frequency of the cantilever. You can also do it as other uh, modes such as peak force tapping. We can use um, all the uh, all the other bells and whistles which are which comes with an AFM system, uh, and and you still can get uh, uh, the resolution and the sensitivity that we're talking about. The other factor is the probe itself is a metal probe. And that actually gives us much more uh, lifetime for the probe. And you're not impacted by the uh, normal tip wear as when it comes to the resolution or the spatial resolution or, or for the electrical information. On this, in this graph, I'm showing the, the scan wave response, the capacitance response with respect to varying the permittivity of the sample or looking at the variation in the dopant concentration. Uh, on the left graph here, I have on the x-axis, the dielectric constant varying on a logarithmic scale. And on the y-axis, I have the SMIM capacitance signal experimentally recorded. As you can see with the variation in the dielectric, the response is, all, is almost linear. This helps in identifying an unknown uh, dielectric constant material. If you have a reference of uh, two, at least two points of uh, a known dielectric uh, constant, that means you can interpolate, also extrapolate to other areas, and as the response is almost linear. This is also true when you look at the uh, variation in the dopant concentration on the right, where I have the x-axis with the variation in the dopant concentration and the y-axis is the uh, SMIM response. As you can see, the uh, I, here we have shown uh, the variation, the, the dopant concentration between E15 to about E20. And you can see the response is almost linear in all of the range. Uh, there is a, a slight uh, variation in the slope at the lower end of it. Uh, uh, it's just because of the intrinsic capacitance variation at these uh, uh, dopant concentration. But this helps in, as the, as the variation is monotonic, it helps in identifying the unknown device, uh, characteristics of an unknown device. To, to, and then I, I want to talk about the applications where, where ScanWave is very, has been very useful. Um, to start with, uh, I'd like to talk about the uh, integrity measurements of the gate oxide integrity and how it's traditionally done. Uh, on the left, we have the how, uh, how you look at the CV measurements today using nanoprober kind of uh, um, uh, technique, uh, wherein you have a large metal plane uh, the probe is also usually larger, and you look at the and you uh, look at the capacitance response as you as you ramp the uh, bias. Uh, this usually requires a larger test structure, uh, and then this I mean from a device perspective, uh, and this must be accessible uh, so that you can the, the probe can actually be in contact with the the metal probe. With uh, with microwaves, and I want to show you a very uh, a cool thing that um, the microwave probe, when you contact the uh, the metal uh, electrode, uh, makes the metal electrode as a proxy for the microwaves, and you can pass on the microwaves from this metal to the the contact via, uh, and actually uh, probe the. Uh, uh, the device, which is act which is buried deeper, uh, and you can access the characteristic response or the capacitance voltage response of this device. Now we have done this for a for a for a device which was already all uh, all packaged or, or not packaged. Uh, the metal layers are already laid down, and we use the um, via as a proxy contact to look at the response of the uh, the device which is buried inside. And there was a fault that we were actually looking at. And what we have found is the region, which was considered as the bad device, has a hysteresis in its CV response compared to a good device indicated in the green here, which has no hysteresis. This helped in localizing where the fault was located and further uh, other physical characterizations can be done to understand what was the reason for the fault. But this was very useful to localize uh, the, uh, uh, the fault and also isolate it uh, uh, and isolate the reasons causing for the fault. 
In the next application, I want to talk about the dopamine concentration measurement. While there are other um, electrical AFM techniques which you use for the uh, for dopamine concentration, traditionally the uh, the industrial standard is using secondary ion mass, mass spectroscopy SIMS. Uh, but the problem with SIMS is that this is a destructive technique as you are uh, uh, sputtering of the material uh, and it, it is uh, relatively slow, uh, requires large area for, uh, for characterization, the space that makes the spatial resolution really lower. Again, the uh, complexity and the, um, the cost uh, uh, with, with, which comes with this is also a bit higher. On the right, we have the uh, uh, scan wave measurements where we can localize the uh, measurements. Um, again, as I've mentioned, we can go to uh, sub, sub 10 nanometers and sub five nanometers spatial resolution very easily. Now, on this, uh, in, this, in this image is a, uh, a staircase structure. This is one of the standards uh, that, we, that we made uh, where the, um, the dopamine concentration is varying between E15 to E20. Uh, we have both P-type and N-type uh, regions here. And as you look at the uh, response of the scan wave, uh, and I just have a single line cross-section, this is not averaged at all. And you can see the stepwise increase in the capacitance response, uh, which, is, which is monotonous. Um, and you can easily uh, calibrate it uh, to an unknown structure as well. And you can see as the, from left to the center, the dopamine concentration is increasing um, and the capacitance corresponding also increases. And the, on the, uh, from the center to the right, the dopamine concentration is reducing for the N-type and the uh, capacitance reduces. So this is very easy to identify what kind of dopamine concentration. Again, this is a relative calibration technique wherein you need a reference to look at the unknown structure. Now, so far we have not talked about the spatial resolution that can be achieved. In the next slide, I wanted to show you um, when we use this scan wave system for a uh, one of the uh, uh, current working nodes, let's say seven nanometer node FinFET. On the top, we have the scanning electron microscope images wherein we can see these individual fins. Um, this is a representational image itself. Uh, and on the bottom, I have the uh, 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 height or the topography image. Uh, the, the surface is relatively smooth. This is a cross-section device that we're looking at. Um, and uh, uh, the topography doesn't indicate any variations in the order. We cannot see the, uh, the, the, the fins in this case. And um, if, we, if I zoom in one of the scan wave uh, uh, channel, uh, you can clearly see these individual fins. And uh, if I take a, a full width half maximum of the signal, you can clearly see that this is about 10 nanometers. Uh, the, the point is this cross-section sample was coated with a protective oxide layer of about three to four nanometers. And we can still look through this oxide layer and uh, probe the, the fins which are buried deeper. So that's the beauty of the microwave, uh, uh, microwaves uh, impedance microscopy in a way. Uh, the signal contrast is obviously gets lower as you, as you have a deeper uh, implant or a, a deeper structure that you're probing. But we can still see the uh, uh, fins, identify these fins, and also look at the variation in the dopamine concentration uh, across the uh, different fins. In the, as, as I've been talking about looking at deeper uh, surfaces or buried surfaces, and I want to uh, give you an idea of where and how much uh, deeper in the volume that we can probe. Uh, for this, we made our special structure and the schematic or the cross-section schematic is shown in this uh, in this picture here, where we have a silicon uh, substrate and on top of it, we have um, uh, silicon oxide islands. These are about 90 nanometers in thickness and then we deposit uh, silicon nitride, polish it completely so that there is no topography involved. The silicon nitride is, um, the, the silicon oxide is actually buried about 200 nanometers from the surface. And the topography 
which is indicated on the right here doesn't show anything. There is no topography that we can see. But this scan wave response, the capacitance response, you can clearly identify individual uh, silicon oxide islands. Now, what is exactly happening is as the probe is scanning from left to right, it is seeing a difference in the capacitance, whether it's coming only from the silicon nitride, full uh, 280 nanometers of silicon nitride, or the capacitance contribution because of the combination of silicon nitride and silicon oxide islands. That's the delta C that we're seeing here. And if I take a line cross section, again, this is a single line cross section, no averaging involved. And you can clearly see how well you can identify the, uh, the silicon oxide islands and the signal to noise ratio that we can see. Um, again, this, this, is, this doesn't mean that we can only see 200 nanometers deeper. We, this is just an example to show that uh, the depth can the, the range of depth that can be probed and the power of the scan wave pro in, in that regard. Um, now, where can this be applied? Uh, one of the applications that we have done a few years back is to look at the non-volatile memory cells uh, and the stored uh, uh, charge in these memory cells. This is a, 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 a device where we polish from the backside and with about still 100 nanometers of silicon left on the surface. And as you look at the uh, SBIM response, you can actually identify the regions which are charged or which are not charged. This is um, in a way uh, uh, almost looking in the cybersecurity kind of thing uh, or spying on a devices in a way that you can read charges on devices which are without actually completely opening up the device. So that's a, that's a very interesting application. Um, now, where, uh, where do we use these, um, um, the, the application that we can uh, look deeper uh, in the uh, subsurface information? You can also go on to the other side, let's say if you want to look at more soft samples uh, in the sense from an AFM point of view, if you're working in contact mode, you, uh, you if and and on a softer sample, you might damage the um, uh, sample or you contaminate the probe. You will not get reproducible electrical results. In those samples, you can use um, scan wave uh, uh, response in in let's say one of the more common softer uh, technique is in on uh, peak force mode where the probe is intermittently contacting the surface and uh, to avoid any translational uh, forces, tra transverse forces. Um, and this peak force mode is usually suitable for soft materials. Now, in this, we have uh, carbon nanotubes on an insulating substrate. I think we have a glass substrate. And these are very well aligned carbon nanotubes. And you can see the topography kind of uh, gives an idea of the presence of these carbon nanotubes. And the on the right side, we have the scan wave uh, capacitance response. And uh, you can clearly identify the capacitance variation between the carbon nanotubes and the background glass substrate here. And if I take a line cross section here, we can take uh, and including the chip convolution, you get about eight nanometers in the uh, in in the spatial resolution that you can see. That the the carbon nanotubes, these are multi wall carbon nanotubes, maybe about two to three nanometers. And if I take a full width half maximum, that's what you would see. But you can clearly resolve that, and you can see the the spatial um, uh, resolution that we can see. This in in peak force mode where you are uh, not always in contact with the sample. So uh, you get a larger lifetime of the probe and you can also look at the softer materials with this. In the next couple of sites, I want to talk about the more emerging material systems and where scan wave uh, uh, can be more powerful uh, um, uh, as an application perspective. The first aspect is uh, looking at the more pattern of, um, of 2D material systems. Again, uh, the, the more pattern is the pattern generated when you have superimposed, when you superimpose two uh, materials with similar lattice constant. And if there is any uh, angle between, uh, uh, between these two materials. The, the Periodicity of the, of the pattern also changes depending upon the angle, uh, the twist angle between the, the layers. Now, in this case, we have um, uh, hexagonal boronitride, which is an insulating material. And on top, you have graphene. 
Um, and uh, the, the periodicity, usually the more super lattice period is about 40 nanometers when the angle is zero. And as you can see from the uh, SMIM capacitance image, you can clearly see the hexagonal honeycomb structure. And if I take a uh, line cross section, you can see full without maximum of about four nanometers. With the periodicity that we're seeing is about 40 nanometers, you can clearly uh, get to the resolution of uh, sub five nanometers here. Now, if we change the angle of orientation, um, in, the, in this case, we're looking at a single crystalline graphene, but if you look at a polycrystalline graphene on a hexagonal boron nitride flake, uh, you can actually look at a variation in the uh, more periodicity. Uh, that we can see here. You see the topography is almost all noisy that we can see this is in contact mode. And the on the right side, you have the SPIM capacitance image where you can actually see the boundaries or the, poly, uh, the crystalline brown, the, the polycrystalline nature of the uh, uh, graphene. Um, and also some of these regions have uh, show some kind of uh, a more a lattice, um, a more a periodicity. But if you zoom in closer, we're actually looking at two different periodicities. In this case, we are looking at 14 nanometers and about 5.5 nanometers period. And if I zoom it in further in this region, this is about 50 by 50 nanometer square image. You can clearly see these various uh, 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 the, the, the super lattice in, in general and the, and the more structure. Uh, not just that, but you can also see the defects which are there, uh, which are present in between the, uh, uh, the two monolayers. And these are about one nanometers in spatial this thing. And you can take a look at the line cross section, which shows the periodicity. All of this is done at room, room temperature and air ambience. Um, and uh, there's no special things that is needed. And this is, this is the magic of microwaves in a way that you can, you can um, get rid of, you, can, you don't have to worry about the surface contamination or anything to, uh, to in a great detail. Usually this, these kind of measurements need a ultra high vacuum conditions and using scanning tunneling microscopes. The other aspect is um, other applications that I want to talk about is the uh, the, the ferroelectric material systems. This is a, a rare earth element and EMO material system. Um, this has about three different phases and two polarities, as as you as schematically shown here. And these three phases intersect at vertices, uh, and this is what is expected. This is a a bulk insulator. And if you look at the uh, topography uh, at the bottom left here, this is this still has some contamination on the top. Um, but when you look at the capacitance variation, um, you can clearly see the uh, difference in the capacitance between uh, individual polarity uh, regions of individual different polarities, um, and identify even the contamination as well. And if you look at the resistance or the conductance image, you can identify that the, the boundary walls conduct much more, the domain walls conduct much more than the, the domains itself. Further, the, the vertices actually blow up much more. Um, and um, uh, this, this, is, this, is, this is done on a bulk insulator. So getting electrical properties of a bulk insulator is, is, is one of the very difficult aspect. Um, and, and I don't think there is any other technique which can do with this kind of spatial resolution. Uh, further, as, as our probes are uh, uh, metal probes, we can actually clean the surface uh, by, uh, let me. <clears throat> Uh, we can actually clean the surface itself to remove this contamination. Uh, if it lets me advance. Can we advance to the next slide? Oh, sorry. Maybe I request the control. Okay, okay sure. Yeah, so uh, you can actually remove the uh, the uh, the contamination that's on the surface and uh, look at the uh, variation, the capacitance and resistance. So this is this is one of those locations where we have cleaned the uh, uh, surface with with, this, with the same probe, and you look at the variation in the capacitance and the uh, resistance of the of the domains and the domain walls. Uh, 
with this, I would uh, uh, give, give it to uh, uh, Yongliang, uh, who will talk about the low temperature scan wave systems, the materials, and the applications. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ravi. And uh, so Ravi already talked uh, about uh, SMM technology and uh, its application and room temperature. So I will continue to talk about uh, SMM at low temperature. In this section, I will first talk about why SMM is so important at low temperature. And then I will give some examples of its application. And later I will talk about uh, low temperature SMM technology. So let's start. Uh, so. Uh, for the field of the condensed matter physics and the advanced uh, material research, people are more interested into doing research at low temperature because only at low temperature, many important and interesting physics happens over there. For example, that uh, what's um, important is that the quantum effect and a quantum core effect superconducting and the topological insulating uh, phase, uh, phase transition from metal to insulated transition. And uh, all, these, uh, all these physics related to the electrical property changes on the sample. So it's very important and critical to have a characterization technology that can measure the electrical properties at low temperature. So let's look at what uh, currently, what is uh, the uh, measurement um, uh, technology. And the first uh, and a very common one is we call it uh, at a low temperature is transport measurement. For the transport measurement, and the people just uh, make that uh, this kind of the electrodes or whole bar on the sample and with the electrodes and the measure the resistivity of this piece. And uh, you can see that it's uh, probably over large air, large area and it's it's local, not localized the information of the sample. And of course, there is some other scanning probe microscopes that can operate at low temperature, as Ravi introduced the conduct EFM, KPFM, but all other uh, technology is not localized electrical measurement. And it's uh, complicated for the sample preparation because it's needed to some uh, uh, electrode on the sample. And because at a sample preparation, that's when you want to do the low temperature, it takes a long time. So a uh, low temperature scan wave will provide a solution that can measure the local electrical property and uh, at nanoscale, it uh, measure local conductivity and permittivity. Because there's no electrode needed and uh, there's minimum the sample preparation, you can just grow sample and uh, to do the testing. And uh, it's, uh, the equipment to provide the faster sample and probe exchange that uh, it's very quick to change the sample and to do experiments. When we do the scanning, it's not only that the electrical measurement, but also the other measurements, for example, topography and DCDV measurement. For some of the research, and uh, especially for the uh, quantum computing or topological insulating, that is, you want to do the sample to be completely clean and without any contamination. That means that requires the sample to be in the UHV condition to do the measurement. Although that is most used uh, uh, scan internal microscope, which can operate at uh, UHV condition, but it's not electrical measurement. It's measures the topography. And uh, also some other technology is not localized uh, information. And also there is some other method, for example, transport measurement, but that one it's not in situ. That means you grow sample in one chamber, you take it out, you make the electrodes, and then in the air, and then pump to you, which it's not in situ. And it is in the air, maybe the sample surface already changed due to the contamination, especially for the gas in the air. So UHV low temperature scan will provide a solution that can, all, can do the SMM measurement at UHV condition. And uh, as this equipment shows that uh, SMM is integrated into the UHV uh, equipment that when you grow sample in one chamber and you can see to transfer to the other sample without exposed to any uh, air or any vacuum, it's 
it's uh, always in the UHV condition and you can just measure the electrical measurement. So, uh, so that uh, low temperature SMM has been widely used into uh, physics research and material research and play uh, very important roles in the research here. I just give a few examples. And the first example is that uh, here is that the sample is a uh, graphite sample, it's 2D material. And uh, also that for this kind of 2D material, you can just uh, make it to, to be a device that with electrode, you can measure the electrode property, but it's not local, you measure the whole piece of the uh, sample. And also other technology is difficult to measure because uh, generally it grows on the insulating sample and it, it's difficult to do that uh, other electrodes. And it was, so here is the show the sample structure. The sample structure is a graphite that salvaged into the boron nitride. And uh, there's a back gate and the back gate by applied uh, apply different voltage, the back gate uh, tuning the Fermi level and it changes the feeling factor of the Landau level. And when the Landau level is uh, completely empty or fully occupied with electrodes, and there is in, it's uh, there is no uh, mobile electrodes that uh, the sample is insulating. But if the half or partially filled that sample, uh, the material sample is conductive, and with this image right shows that the SMM image scanning on the same line and when changes at that back gate to tuning the feeling uh, level and uh, change the feeling factor. You can see that when the feeling factor, uh, feeling factor is zero, one, two, six, and 10, that the bulk itself is insulating because that it's uh, lambda level is fully amplating or leave or fully occupied, but the edge is uh, in, uh, is conductive, showing topo uh, topographic uh, conductive edge. And uh, the next sample, next uh, example is about is use SMM to measure that uh, to conductive domain wall. And generally, for material, that uh, the most uh, common one is to do the transport measurement. As the figure A shows that it's transport measurement. And you can see it's two curves. That untrained curve means that it's just the city over there and to do the transport when, when the temperature change. And the trained sample means that they applied a magnetic field on the sample, that a magnetic field, a magnetic field on the sample. And they notice that when it's applied magnetic field, that it's the sample, it's, it's more insulating. And um, it might be due to the domain of phase transition or someone else, but without, uh, without to localize the electrical measurement, no one knows what happens. And then with SMM, you can see that this is SMM image. And on this image, the bright means conductive, uh, the dark means insulating. You can see that the reason why it's con it's conductive for the untrained sample because on these samples there is a lot of the bright uh, lines which is corresponding to the domain wall, and uh, the research uh, the researchers know what why it's happening because untrained sample for this kind of sample it has uh, uh, magnetic domains up and down when without magnetic it's randomly just spontaneously uh, sit over there. And when you measurement, it cr creates a lot of the domain walls, which is conductive. And, but when you apply the, a magnetic field in the E, that means that all the domains either just towards the magnetic field direction. And on this sample, you formed just one domain, single domain. And then there's only a few or no domain wall. That's why with trained sample that the, uh, the resistivity is high. So only with SMM, you can see that localized the electrical property and uh, see the physics beneath that one. And uh, this is another example that it also uh, shows that uh, resistance uh, network in magnet. And uh, also that uh, transport measurement is applied to study this to study this material. You can see that it's got the similar curves as previous one and the resistivity is changed. 
Let's see. What's happening? It's because domain wall or because domain, we do know. And only with SMM technology, we can see that. Uh, this one is that uh, it's 2.4 Tesla. And this one, the D is nine Tesla. You can see the difference from 2.4 to nine Tesla is that the yellow region is increased. And the red region is corresponding to additive ferromagnetic domain. And the yellow region is corresponding uh, uh, magnetic domain, uh, very mag magnetic domain. And you can see that the conductivity change is from, it's because the phase transition from the adverse mag magnetic to very magnetic domain. And what is more important with SMM, we can see that it's the change of the domain is not random, it's towards one direction, towards this x and y direction because that it's a crystal direction so with only smm we can see these details about the sample locally right so let's talk about uh, uh, uh low temperature scan wheel system and uh, there are three kind of the uh, low temperature system one is two the first one is 2k and the 2k system is that uh, as man integrated into a cross stack that can go to below two kelvin and it can work with uh wet system or it can work with dry system with compressor with uh, uh, uh automatic gas handling system and it's a turkey solution and uh, you can see that it's top loading one. That means you can just uh, take the sample and prove out to do the quick sample exchange. And uh, it can directly measure uh, connectivity and permittivity and below uh, two Kelvin. And also it's compatible with that magnetic field up to 12 Tesla. You can do the contact measurement, non-contact measurement and the sample preparation is pretty straightforward. And here is that to show uh, 2K scan wave system. You can see that uh, we have the scanner positioner and the EFM state uh, uh, platform at low temperature and our probe holders and uh, match network at low temperature. In order to benefit from the no noise of the low temperature, we put the front end the electronics into cross stack, which has a lower uh, thermal noise and uh, the electronics connected to the low temperature system controller. And uh, in one scanning, people can get topography, uh, SMMC channel, SMRR channel is uh, corresponding to that uh, permittivity and conductivity. And the people can also apply the AC and the DC voltage to do that DC-DV amplitude and DC-DV phase. And the EFM itself, it's used that laser Inferometer to detect the deformation of the cantilever. That's why you can just keep the constant height or constant force to do the scanning and get the result. So here is that you can see on the right is a photo that the installer system. We have the um, micro electronics here and the insert is in the press stack. And here is the front end the electronics on the uh, insert and here shows that uh, the EFM stack, a uh, sample, and a cat liver, laser faro, and match network. So uh, we also, some people want to do um, some research, especially for the quantum computing. They want to do the uh, electrical characterization below uh, 100 millikelvin. That's why we developed that uh, low temperature millikelvin system. And the millikelvin system is a turkey solution. And uh, you can see that it's a cross stack a dilution refrigerator. And uh, this is the insert of the dilution refrigerator. And the sample tube. Uh, sample probe is inserted is insert in this direction and EFM and SMM is set in this position with the superconductor magnet around there. And uh, it's, you can see that uh, the sample is seated here and the probe is he seated here and the match net work is also seated here. It can reach below 100 millikelvin. And this is show that uh, low temperature uh, SMM image at 19 millikelvin and uh, aluminum dot sample and we get clearly SMMC image and clearly SMMR image. The image is pretty sharp, show that it's very uh, stable and with high signal noise ratio. 
And uh, for the UE tree system, we have the low temperature UE tree scan weaver system. It's uh, it's a different uh, it's a different uh, uh, system that uh, the uh, SMM is integrated into the UE tree condition and connected to the other chambers. For example, MB's chamber, and the people can just group the sample in this MB chamber and uh, in the UHV environment transfer to SMM chamber and load down to low temperature with magnetic to do the AFN, to do the SMM measurement. Or they can also, we also have the load lock that you can just uh, load other samples and also to do the quick sample probe exchange. That uh, for this equipment that it can just, you can connect uh, more, MB chambers or other SPM chambers, or whatever you want, and it can reach that temperature below 1K and with high magnetic up to 12 Tesla. And it's used kinematic SMM holders, and so that when you prepare the probes and you put it there, it will also align with electrically and also optically that with laser shield on the backside of the cantilever to sense the deformation of the cantilever to get the topography information about the sample. So this one shows that uh, you uh, as my image at 400 millikelvin. The sample is a luminous dot sample and here is the topography uh, image. You can see it's pretty clear with all the small features you can see that one. And here is the SMM image. You can see that the image is pretty clear, all the defects and the dust that's on the sample, we can, small, small dust, we can see that. And the topography noise is about 80 picometer, and the noise in the SMM is 0.5 microvolts, which is pretty low that you can get a very good image with high signal noise ratio. So, Okay, let me give the whole uh, summary of, one, uh, of this talk. So ScanWave SMM, it's a local electrical property measurement. It can directly measure the local electro uh, permittivity and the conductivity. For the semiconductor sample, it can measure the carrier type and the carrier concentration. And it's compatible with many EFM measurement modes, for example, contact modes, tapping mode, non-contact mode image, for example, nap mode, uh, peak force tapping. It can be operated at room temperature and also low temperature in vacuum and uh, with magnetic field. And it's because it's used microwave, it's compatible with wide range of the materials, for example, dielectrics, insulators, uh, semiconductors, semiconductor, not silicon, but silicon uh, ni uh, gallium, uh, nitrides and uh, silicon carbonate, and also metals. It's compatible with the fire electrics, fire ma magnetics, domain, domain walls, grid boundaries. And it can mirror 1D material, for example, carbon nanotube, nanowires, and also 2D materials, graphene, uh, molydisulfur, all kinds of the 2D materials. And uh, it has very new capabilities. It can uh, operate at linear SMM, directly mirror the sample. And also you can apply DC and AC voltage to do the nonlinear measurements to get the DC DV imaging and also get the CV curve at nanoscale. Uh, it can mirror the sample surface and also can, can mirror that uh, features beneath the sample surface show uh, dielectric layers and also it has nanoscale CV curves that can measure uh, beneath surface and also for the semiconductor you can use your uh, the wire connection as the extent of the probes to measure that properties beneath that metal layer. So uh, thank you and uh, let's uh, go to the ask questions.